And our subject is signs of Christ's presence in the church. And there are a number of them in the passage ahead from the last part of chapter 18 and into chapter 19. So we'll look at five mentioned evidences of the presence of Christ in his church. And we begin here in verse 24 with, and this will be a first heading, the Lord's provision. The Lord provides to his people, his sincere people, believing in the truth, those who love Christ and have come to him, and those who labor for him and serve him as a church. And there are many provisions. We saw it with the provision of Luke. Suddenly Luke appears out of the blue. Previously in our studies in Acts, one of the Apostle Paul's greatest helpers, and of course one who was used of God too, a penman of Holy Scripture, the one who wrote this book of Acts along with the Gospel of Luke. We saw it in the case of Luke. We saw it in the case of Timothy. Timothy, one of the greatest soldiers of the cross in the New Testament, converted under the preaching of Paul, and yet matured rapidly in the faith and presents himself for Christian service. And Paul takes him gladly under his wing. And what a servant of God he proved to be. And now you find it with Apollos. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, and no doubt educated in the great university of Alexandria of those times, so famous, so prominent, and he's described as an eloquent man, naturally capable and gifted with great power of eloquence and mighty in the scriptures. He's deficient in his understanding of certain things, as we shall see, but he is mighty in the scriptures. He's an extraordinary man, Apollos. By the work of the Spirit in his heart, he clearly come to understand so much truth. Yes, he was shut up into the Old Testament in some of his understanding, but he grasped the whole covenant of grace. He grasped what Moses had been preaching to the people, recorded in Deuteronomy 29 and 30, as alongside that fearsome law covenant, do this and live. There was a gracious offer of salvation by God at the same time. And he'd understood it. And he seems to have understood the prophecies of Christ, that the promised one would come. And he'd understood them not in terms of the Messiah being the nation of the Jews, in some sense, but a person who would come. He saw it so clearly. And uh, he'd come to the time when he'd been deeply affected by a disciple of John, so the record seems to indicate, we'll go on and read that, and he'd, the disciple of John had said to him, well, Christ has come. Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ, and we know that. And John the Baptist would say, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. So Apollos understood all that, and he believed in the mercy of God for salvation. He didn't believe that the ceremonies of the Jewish church saved, though he followed them and believed in them as great pointers and visual aids and wonderful parts of the ancient worship. Yet he knew they did not save in themselves, and nor did the law, good as it was, because no one could keep it. But the, he believed the prophecies and the promises that the Messiah would come, the great descendant who would atone for sin in some way, somehow. He didn't see clearly how, but he believed in those things. So he was, in every sense, a saved man because he believed in the mercy of God. He repented of his sin. He trusted in God alone and he walked with him. And yet, his understanding was not holy. Christian. His mind still to a large degree lived in the Old Testament. He believed in Christ, but you see, John the Baptist had died before the crucifixion. 
He knew nothing of the crucifixion. He'd been taken home to glory. He knew nothing of the resurrection. He knew nothing of the day of Pentecost and the great beginning of the church proper when the Holy Spirit came down upon the people of God. He didn't know about those things and the disciples of John were a bit out of date. They weren't preaching those things. So there was a difficulty in that uh, the Apostle Paul and others wanted to reach the disciples of John too because they were pious, earnest, saved and yet deficient in their knowledge of doctrine. And then Apollos comes. What a provision he was going to be to the church. Verse 25, we read, This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. And when you read that in the New Testament, it means the way of Christ, that we owe everything to a saviour who would come, and that was Jesus of Nazareth. But there were all the parts I mentioned he wasn't fully conversant with. And being fervent in spirit, hot in the spirit is the Greek, warm, fervent, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. He would have made himself quite unpopular. For all his eloquence, he was going to the synagogues, and when they called upon him as a cultured and educated man to contribute and to speak, he would speak, and so powerfully, did you not know that Messiah has come, that Christ has come? It was Jesus of Nazareth who went about doing good. He was hazy on the nature of the atonement, somehow he takes away sin. He wasn't quite sure how, because he wasn't up to date with Calvary, but he believed so much of these things. He taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Verse 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, you know who they were? Husband and wife, tent makers, converted probably in Rome, had gone to Corinth when Emperor Claudius evicted all the Jews from Rome. Paul had found them when he went to Corinth and they had stayed, he had stayed with them and now they'd travelled with Paul to Ephesus. But, Ephes but Paul had gone on. He'd started to preach at Ephesus, but then he felt very moved to go back to Jerusalem and uh, then return a little later. So Aquila and Priscilla were left here. And uh, when, uh, when Apollos, they heard Apollos preaching in the synagogue and they took him home and they brought him up to date. You're absolutely right. They said, Jesus of Christ is the Messiah. But didn't you know that on Calvary, that was where he atoned for sin? He suffered and died, and he rose from the dead on the third day. And Apollos may have heard something of these things, but he didn't know the facts. And great as he was, and orator as he was, and mighty and learned in the scriptures as he was, he listened to the two tent makers in their home and all the blanks in his knowledge were filled in and being an earnest and believing man he was immediately able to preach these things and he was a tremendous gift to the church of that time when he was verse 27 disposed to pass into a car the brethren wrote as a wonderful little clue Apollos wanted to go to Corinth and uh, maybe Aquila and Priscilla had suggested it to him. And so the brethren wrote, well, who were they? Well, a church had already formed. Paul had only visited there for a very short time. Now he'd left uh, Aquila and Priscilla here at Ephesus and uh, already there were converts because the brethren wrote that the church at Ephesus was already in a position to recommend Apollos to Corinth in a car. And then in verse 28 you read that when he got there, he mightily convinced the Jews. And that's a wonderful thing, I may say, by the way, because 
Paul had been obliged to leave the synagogue at Corinth because they'd reviled Christ and they'd slandered him and Paul also. But the grace of God is so patient because now, in a sense, God sends Apollos to Corinth even after they've rejected the preaching of the gospel. And so another man goes into the synagogue at Corinth and preaches Christ. And you read about it there in chapter 18, verse 28. He mightily convinced the Jews. So even in that place of rejection, after all, yet more were persuaded and converted. And that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Now, I must just say this, though I'm interfering with the narrative a little, but you know, God is so gracious. There is such a thing as judicial hardening. A person can reject the message of the gospel and harden their hearts, and we'll read more about that later, to the point where God deals with them no more. And you read about that in the New Testament. But equally, God is so patient and so full of mercy because you also read of situations where he has utterly rejected the people harden their hearts, insult and even attack the messengers, and yet further provision is made for their salvation. Yet another person is sent to appeal to their hearts. First the Apostle Paul, some converted, rejection, and now Apollos. And even in these verses in chapter 19 that we go to, there'll be yet another indication of mercy at Corinth. And anyway, it's worth your, you, you never know. You have a relation, you have a colleague, and they've listened to you and now turned against the message. Don't give them up entirely. It may be that they'll come under a kind of judicial hardening by God and be put to one side. But it may be that even after a solid rejection, God may melt the heart and revisit that person and show mercy. And that happens so often. But now, chapter 19, and we're still on this point that God provides for his church. It's, it's one of the signs of Christ's presence. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus. We could say, came back to Ephesus. He'd been there a very short time. And finding certain disciples, this is not uh, Aquilus and, and Priscilla and the small band of people who've been converted already of course Paul is going to associate with them he is probably in Ephesus living with Aquila and Priscilla as he was before at Corinth but he somehow finds certain other disciples and it's extraordinary these people are in the same position that Apollos was in. They're people who've been brought to God by disciples of John. Verse 2. The Apostle Paul is obviously rather suspicious about this, I would think. He seems to have a, an awareness that there's something missing with these disciples. They're earnest, they, they love Christ, and yet they don't know him well enough. He said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? There was some deficiency in their conversation. Don't know where he found them. We're not told. It's unlikely he found them in the synagogue, though it's possible he found them there. But if they were there, these twelve men, with their families presumably, but if they were in the synagogue worshipping, then you'd think that Aquila and Priscilla would have found them previously. But no, Paul finds these, perhaps in the marketplace, somewhere. And they say to him, we've never heard of the Holy Spirit. We didn't know there was such a thing as the Holy Spirit. This suggests 
that they may not necessarily have been Jews even. Though it's probable they were Jews as disciples of John. But not if they'd never heard of the Holy Spirit. Most Jews would have heard of the Holy Spirit. But at that time. But anyway they hadn't. Well that tells Paul all he wants to know. That they are probably people who have heard the message of God from disciples of John. Verse 3. He said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And back comes the answer, unto John's baptism. Now John's baptism was very good. But it was before Christ, in a sense. Before the crucifixion, before the atonement, before the resurrection. It was a baptism of repentance. Indicating repentance from sin. But it wasn't enough. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. It was a preparatory baptism. They should believe with all their hearts on Christ. Now, were these men, these 12 men, converted or not? Like Apollos, they weren't up to date in the message. They were living, well, their trust in God was in the mercy of God. That Christ had been promised, that Christ had come. They weren't sure what he'd done and how he took away sin. But they sincerely trusted in him. That Christ is the saviour. Somehow he will save us. Somehow. Now of course they could be saved by that. As the Old Testament Christians were. They trusted in the one who was to come. Who would save. Who would purchase salvation. And if you trusted in him. The promised saviour who was coming. Even if you didn't understand exactly how he would do it. If you trusted in him and his mercy. You would be saved in Old Testament times. And these people were like that, like Apollos also. But they didn't know quite how it was done. Could Paul have said to them, well, you're saved, so I won't tire you with the up-to-date details. I'll leave you as you are because you are saved. No, he couldn't do that because glory has to be brought to Christ. And now that Christ has suffered and died and sunlight has come and we know all the details of salvation, then we should live in the full light of that and praise him and love him and be indebted to him. It wasn't enough that they should be saved in the Old Testament sense. Their souls safe, trusting in the mercy of what Messiah would one day do. They must love him for it and know exactly what he's done. We're now in the Christian era. They must be brought up to date. And so he spoke of Christ to them. That they should, and when they heard this, verse 5, they were immediately baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. You see, for them it was coming up to date. They were already saved but they didn't understand entirely how. And they must understand how the atoning death of Christ and they must give Christ the glory and make him the centre of their lives. And this moves us on, you see, to a second great sign of Christ's presence in the church. First of all, we see Christ providing for us. He provides the needs of churches that truly love him and serve him. He provides them with ministry and with teaching. He provides them with officers, raises up people in their midst. He provides them if they pray with a means to, of worshipping him in a place. Christ does wonderful things. It's a great sign of Christ's presence in his church that he provides for his people. But this second sign is that Christ is all to the people. In a lukewarm church, it may be sound, but not serving the Lord 
not in earnest. One of those churches, like the church of Laodicea in the book of Revelation in the early chapters, it may be sound, but sound asleep and not functioning. It won't see these signs. But in a church which is walking with Christ and serving him, Christ will be all to the people. It isn't enough, says the Apostle Paul, for you to believe that Christ will come and somehow take away sin for you. He has come, and you must appreciate what he has done, and you must love him for it and be indebted to him, and he must be at the very center of your life. He must be the source of your strength. He must be the object of your worship. He must eclipse everything and take over everything from you. And you love him and pray to him day by day and thank him and walk with him and seek communion with him. All the prayers you offer to God the Father, you offer through him and in his name. And uh, you don't over-admire anymore the things of this world. Though there are things in this world that merit our admiration We don't worship them and spend too much time with them and over-like them because all our emotional energy or the best of it is for Christ. And Christ is all to his people when they're walking as they should. And that's what we're seeing here. Verse 5, when they heard this, They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then something remarkable and unusual happened. Verse 6, And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. They were going to have a kind of miniature Pentecost. This is the last, by the way, of the miniature Pentecosts in the New Testament. The first was when the gospel was preached to the Samaritans. The second was in the household of Cornelius, when the Gentiles were first converted in any number. And there was a miniature Pentecost for them. And now it's these 12 Johnites, if if I may call them Johnites, disciples of John the Baptist, who loved the Messiah, but they hadn't come to a clear understanding of what Christ had actually done and he wasn't first and foremost in their lives. So there were three miniature Pentecosts. At Pentecost the Holy Spirit came down on the church when he came down on those few Samaritans it's a kind of token symbolic miniature Pentecost which says to the Jewish converts the Samaritans are one with you They have the Holy Spirit as you have. It's one church. The Gentiles, the household of Cornelius, and now the Johnites, three different classes of person. And there is a kind of symbolic miniature Pentecost, which is a great blessing to them, but it tells the church for posterity that all are one in Christ Jesus. And so this remarkable event took place. But it wouldn't continue and it wouldn't uh, uh, be recorded in other churches that the Apostle Paul founded. But then, verse 8, the Apostle goes into the synagogue, speaks for three months. See those words I pointed out to you before, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. He was a persuasive preacher. In the presentation of the gospel, I remind you once again, it's necessary to persuade people and to appeal to them. The work of the Holy Spirit is essential and vital. He alone opens the heart, regenerates the soul, brings the person to listen, inclines the will. The person seems to come freely and voluntarily to Christ, and so they do, but it's all due to that regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. But still, outwardly, humanly, God desires to use the persuasions of the gospel to appeal consciously to the human heart. Verse 9, 
But when, verse 9, diverse were hardened and believed not were hardened, well, they hardened themselves. The uh, 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 construction of the sentence here in English shouldn't lead us to believe that they were initially hardened by God. God may well have judicially hardened them as well, but when divers were hardened isn't meant to indicate it unto them, but of themselves. They rejected the gospel. They resisted it. They disliked it. Why? They believe not, but speak evil of that way before the multitude. Perhaps they said that the preachers, like the Apostle Paul, were fugitives from justice in Jerusalem, or phonies, were heretics. They spake evil of the gospel and said it was false and it was untrue. And they turned against it. But why should they? Just think for a moment. Here is the Apostle Paul. And he is speaking of the love of God. And he is speaking of Christ. And how God, the second person of the Trinity, came in astonishing love and suffered and died the full eternal consequences of sin. So that we may be forgiven and reconciled with God and set on the heavenly pathway. This gospel of astonishing love, why would anyone turn against it? Why would the congregation at, of the synagogue at Ephesus, or most of them, prove so difficult and find it so objectionable? Why would they hate it? repudiate the preachers of the Christian gospel and revile them and slander them. Why would you do this? It is astonishing. Why does it happen today? We say to people, we need a saviour. Christ is the saviour. He suffered and died for all those who would be forgiven and will go to heaven. This is the kindness and the mercy of God. Then he rebuilds the heart and gives you a new nature and relates you to himself makes you a child of God and people bristle and we may have bristled at one time and reject it and hate it astonishing the hostility of the human heart it's not as though the apostle Paul is preaching to them you must do this you must do that that's what Wrongly, their Jewish church was telling them at that time. Mistakenly, it was saying you must comply with all this ceremonial and this will get you the favor of God. It was imposing heavy burdens upon them. And the apostle comes saying, no, God will change your life and forgive you freely and pour down upon you all his loving kindness. We hate you they say. And that's our reaction to the gospel so often when we first hear it. It is extraordinary, isn't it? What a poor light it puts the human race in that our hearts are so hard towards God. Just as the Bible says, it's true. We are so fundamentally rebellious. It's our pride. This man is talking about repenting of sin. And the Lord will save me and change me. He's making me look bad. And I'm not going to grovel before God in any kind of repentance. And I like my self-determination and to run my own life and be boss of all my own affairs. I'm not going to start obeying the Bible or the Lord or God. I'm not going to be in subjection to Almighty God, kind as you say he is. I don't want that. And I love my sins, things I'm into. And I know they're incompatible with this Christ who you speak to me about. And this is the way we react. It's our pride and our sinfulness. It is astonishing every time you read things like this. But it may be how we were when we first heard the gospel. Verse 9. When divers were hardened... And believe not, 
but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them. And it was time to take all the disciples, the believers in Christ, and he disputed daily in the school of one Tyrannus. Can't tell you anything about him. He was a teacher in the city, presumably, or an owner of the lecture hall and the school. What he taught, nobody knows. Did he teach philosophy to adults? Did he teach children? Some people seem to find a case for suggesting he taught medicine. But the hall wasn't used all the time, so he was prepared to either rent it, or if he was a converted man, lend it to the apostle for other parts of the day. And you can see these were not only meetings for teaching, but they were evangelistic meetings to save souls, because people who would come to hear were obviously invited to that place, and every day there was a Bible study or a meeting held by the Apostle Paul, because he's described as disputing daily. Disputing is the word which means laying out before the people all the arguments of the gospel. Why you need salvation. Why, how we, why we teach that it is Christ who is the Savior. And he laid those arguments out. So it, every day there was something of an evangelistic soul winning character. And the people were built up. Verse 10, and this continued by the space of two years so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Well, of course, the apostle was assisted by others and people went out from that place and they spoke to crowds far and wide and the message spread and Ephesus became a marvelous center for the proclamation, the preaching of the gospel. Now I've got just a third heading I want to tell you about, and it's this, that in a church where Christ is present, there is seriousness and conscientiousness, and there is a certain amount of, let's call it, godly fear. There is great joy in the hearts of people, who were Christians, but there was also godly fear. And I, I'm going to show you this from these words from verse 11. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Special is a very complex Greek word in the original, and roughly speaking, it means not usual miracles. Quite unusual, strikingly unusual things. Our translators have chosen the word special, which reflects it well. God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Nobody else, none of the helpers, only Paul. You see, by the hands of the apostles. I know there are Christians who say and imagine that everybody could heal in the New Testament. And it was going on all the time. By the hands of the apostles. By the hands of the apostles. By the hands of Paul, the apostle. These healings, Christ did them, and his disciples, and the apostles were given this power to authenticate them as special, as being inspired men, and so on. God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. And there's a note about them in verse 12. So that from his body, which really means his hands that have already been mentioned, things that he, he touched were brought unto the sick, handkerchiefs or aprons explained in different ways, and diseases departed from them, and also evil spirits went out of them. So from that center in Ephesus, Paul's efforts were magnified as though he was a whole group of apostles able to move around. And his betokenings, his, his authenticating signs 
were seen by this means. And this was very unusual or unique. But of course, it was only the apostle who could do them. So these things didn't happen after the apostle Paul and after the age of the apostles. And there's even a further note here by Luke in verse 13, and this will soon bring us to the point, about certain of the vagabond Jews. That means uh, uh, traveling Jews. They traveled about. Uh, There were certain people made money out of religion, as they are today. And there were among the Jews certain people who set themselves up as exorcists. And they went around casting out demons, or so they claimed. And they were paid for it. Of course, when the true servants of God were able to truly cast out demons in those early days, they didn't take money for it. But these people were scoundrels. And they were travellers. Of course, they really had to be. Because if they stayed in one place too long, it would soon be obvious that their exorcisms didn't work very well. And they'd be in trouble. So they took money, performed the exorcisms, and quickly got out of town and went somewhere else. But they were always looking to be more effective, be able to make more money. Then certain of the vagabond traveling Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus. We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. So they hijacked the name of Christ in the hope of making their rituals sound more effective. And they came unstuck. You probably know the account, verses 14 and 15. It mentions seven particular such traveling Jews, exorcists, who were the sons of a priest. And uh, 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 they possibly sought authentication even from that. And they cast out or tried to an evil spirit from a sadly possessed man. And they were attacked and humiliated and wounded and this spread abroad and uh, it had a double purpose verse 17 and this was known to all the Jews and Greeks the Gentiles dwelling at Ephesus and fear fell on them all and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified so this 17th verse describes not only how those traveling Jews burned their fingers trying to hijack the name of Christ and use it for making money and exorcisms but it covers also the miracles of Paul they gave rise to fear falling on people and that's interesting because you read that all the way back in Acts chapter 2 and verse 43 but I won't turn to it now that the miracles that the apostles worked caused people to be in fear. They made the people solemn and fearful, awestruck, cautious. And that's repeated several times through the book of Acts, that this or that event or apostolic miracle caused fear. So I make that a special point. And just briefly, my third heading that where Christ is, there is solemnity and fear alongside joy in a church. So here is this situation where it comes through healings and the miraculous work of an apostle. But now that's past, it comes through the work of the Holy Spirit in a heart. Think of the healings the nonsense, uh, phony healings that happen today. Why they happen in a most extraordinary atmosphere. Here's a congregation of maybe charismatic style people and they're singing to hymns and things and choruses to what sounds exactly like pop music. Uh, 
and they're jigging and dancing and it's, the whole thing is like an entertainment and a, a lightweight thing and in the middle of it there are claimed miracles going on. Well, that's nothing like how it was in Bible times when there were authentic miracles worked by apostles. The result was awe and trembling and seriousness. You couldn't fool with this God because even if it was a healing miracle, it was so out of the ordinary that people were made serious by it. This is wonderful. This is astonishing. We can't, uh, we can't just be glib when we listen to this message. We've got to be straightforward. You can't toy with this God, with the God of Christ. And uh, it's quite different from today. If you had an apostolic miracle today, well, through salvation, you'd have joy in the Lord. But it would also make you serious. And where Christ is and the Spirit is at work, People are happy Christians, but they're also serious Christians. Now we read on and we see how it's applied here. Verse 18. And many that believed, and there were many, turning to the gospel and believing, came and confessed and showed their deeds. One of the effects of miracles is it made people afraid. I've got to be genuine. I've come to Christ. I believe in Calvary. I believe in the forgiveness of sin. I cannot at the same time keep any of those charms that used to mean so much to me. I cannot keep any of those things. They're hateful. They're horrible. They're offense to my Savior. I must be holy for him. No more fetishes. No more superstitions. No more anything. I've been very surprised times over the years, once or twice, maybe someone who's died, who was a Christian, and uh, there was a funeral, and after the person was buried, some strange group of people turned up to do all kinds of uh, fetish ceremonies, around the grave and you discovered to your horror that this person who was supposed to be a professing Christian was at the same time still knee deep in old tribal fetishes and superstitions that should have been completely put out of their lives. Now how could they do both things at once? How, how was it they'd never become serious? When Christ is at work in a life or in a church, people are serious. You can't compromise. You can't offend him. You don't want to offend him. You love him. He's your all in all. And all those old things go. Everything that belongs to the old life goes. And you see it here. Many that believed, they came and confessed and showed their deeds many of them also which use curious arts and magic and superstitious things they brought their books together don't visualize books like a modern book visualize a little roll or scroll it was just a little piece of papyrus and it was wound into a little roll and you kept it on you, hidden somewhere because it had written on it some formula for a charm or for some magic. It's what you'd like to have on you to protect you when you were a heathen, when you were a pagan, an idolater. But now you're a Christian, you should have got rid of it. Everything of the kind should have gone and all these little rolls came out and people threw them on a bonfire. It goes on to say they burned them. They all went, a great burning of these things and possibly idols too and charms and bracelets and things that had occult significance. They brought their books together and burned them before all men suggests a testimony 
I want to be rid of them and denounce them. I'm ashamed of them that I ever had them. And they counted the price of them. I see my time is up. You're looking far too interested, so you've tempted me to go over. It's your fault. <laughs> and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. That's 20 years wages of four men, somebody calculated in those days. It was a very superstitious region. When Christ is in a church, wonderful things happen. And I must conclude, the Lord provides. The Lord becomes supreme in every life. He's our all in all. I could have mentioned that the gospel offends the people who will not turn. The gospel gives godly fear and you can't toy with God and compromise in any way you love him. So you have awe and godly fear as well as joy and peace in your heart and other things we didn't have time for. But these, you read here, wonderful evidences of the effects when Christ is really active and really present.